right. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. And um, I never know which side of these debates I want to get so <laughs> until I start working on them. And then uh, hopefully I can convince you that uh, our standard approach of using chemotherapy alone is still the best uh, approach in this situation. So first of all, just to sort of summarize, what are the goals of the pre-transplant salvage regimens? Um, and I put uh, highlighted there to enable patients to proceed with autologous stem cell transplant. So that is really the ultimate goal is to get the patient to the transplant. And um, sort of the sub bullets under that, having a high CR rate by PET-CT prior to the transplant, and I'll talk more about that. Um, having acceptable, acceptable hematologic and non-hematologic toxicity, and not compromising uh, the ability to mobilize stem cells. And I just put that curve up there, which is um, really trying to emphasize why you are really trying to enable patients to proceed with autologous stem cell transplant. So this is from a phase two study that we did in the CLGB several years ago, looking at the regimen of gemcitabine, venerelbine, and doxel. And this shows the event-free survival for patients. Uh, the top curve shows the patients who received this regimen and then went on to a stem cell transplant, so second-line treatment. And then the bottom curve are for patients uh, who had already failed a transplant, and this was just used as salvage post-transplant. And the response rates in both groups of patients, both pre- and post-transplant, was over 70%. And yet, despite those high response rates, the patients who had already failed a transplant had a very rapid relapse of their disease. So really not thinking that these treatments by themselves in the majority of patients will provide a durable remission. So what are the obstacles to identifying and selecting the best second-line salvage regimen? And um, there are several, some of which appear not to be, uh, that we can't get past them. So the first is that there are really no phase three trials comparing these second-line regimens, and therefore there's really no gold standard second-line regimen to serve as the comparator um, for new combinations moving forward. Most of these regimens have been tested only in small phase two studies, often single center studies, and it's also very difficult to assess the late toxicities of any of these regimens. Certainly the acute toxicities are straightforward, but because the patients all go on to autologous stem cell transplant, we really don't know um, whether the treatment we gave them before transplant has anything to do with the late toxicities. Other obstacles, many reports do not include PET response in any of the patients or in all of the patients. And so, um, again, I just wanted to show sort of a comparison, again, of the GVD regimen about how PET can affect your response interpretation. So the first, um, read the first uh, study there is when it was used as second line in the, in the study I just discussed with the CLGB. There were 49 patients who were treated post-transplant. They had an overall response rate of 65% with a CR rate of 20%. And at that time, we used only CT to evaluate the response and the CRs. And then Dr. Moskowitz and his colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering actually used the GVD regimen as a third line regimen in patients who had not achieved a complete remission mission with their second line regimen of ICE and treated 33 patients with GVD. All of the patients had a PET following the GVD with an overall response rate of 79% with 52% CR rates. So an even later uh, line of therapy resulted in a significantly higher CR rate, which I think is just simply a matter of having PETs and not having PETs. And so the other question and, and problem that we always have when we're trying to evaluate these pre-transplant salvage regimens is, what is the primary endpoint for evaluating these regimens? Is it a PET-CR pre-transplant, or is it the progression-free or event-free survival post-transplant? And this is just a table that shows some of the most common pre-transplant chemotherapy regimens that we use. So I listed the five regimens that I think are used most commonly in the U.S., in Canada, in Europe. And uh, as you can see, the CR rates, some of which had a PET, some of which did not have a PET, are kind of all over the board there in the um, second column from the right, and that they are range from 7% with the GDP regimen using no PET scan, 
to as high as 54 to 61 percent with the IGEV and the IEV, and uh, the, at least the IGEV had a PET scan. But if you look at the far right column, looking at the progression-free or event-free survival, and again, those numbers are um, ranging from two-year event-free survival to five-year, depending on what uh, was in the publication. But as you can see, they all look very similar, so sort of ranging anywhere from 51 to 68 percent. So at least on the basis of looking at all of the historical small trials, you would think that the event-free survival or the progression-free survival is probably the endpoint that you want to look at with these patients. Um, and, and historically has been what we have been most interested in. Um, more recently, over the last couple of years, there have been uh, some publications looking at whether the PET-CR pre-transplant uh, is prognostic of the eventual event-free sur survival. And I'm really going to just show uh, two studies looking at this. And the largest one is from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and this was the first publication. It was a phase two study from Dr. Moskowitz, 97 patients with relapsed or refractory Hodgkin lymphoma following their first line of therapy. And they either received ice or augmented ice for two cycles. And that decision was based on their um, risk factors at relapse. Uh, if they had risk factors, they were given augmented ice. If they did not have risk factors, they were given standard ice. And augmented ice um, basically doubles the doses of ifosamide and etoposide and uses the same carbo dose. So it's definitely a much more aggressive regimen. And then patients had a PET CT following the second cycle, and they were considered to be a CR if they had a Deauville score of one or two. If they did not have a CR, they went on to receive two cycles of GVD. And if they had a CR, to ICE and or GBD, then they went on to their stem cell transplant, and the majority of them received a radiation-based regimen. So this is um, their sort of conclusion, which is that patients who have a CR following two cycles of ICE, or interestingly, two cycles of ICE followed by GVD, if they had a CR to either the ICE or the GVD, they had an excellent prognosis with a three-year event-free survival of 80%. And this was regardless of their pre um, salvage risk factors. And you can see if they did not achieve a CR to either ICE or to GVD, then their outcomes were significantly worse. And about 78% of the patients in the study achieved a CR to one regimen or the other. The second study was actually a retrospective study that was done at our institution uh, by Todd Feniger and uh, one of his fellows, Dr. Smeltzer. And this was, we had 106 patients who were transplanted at WashU for relapsed Hodgkin's between 2001 and 2007. And of those 106 patients, 46 patients had had a pre-transplant PET following their second line salvage. The PETs here were done uh, anywhere from one to four, after one to four cycles of salvage. And there was a variety of salvage regimens that were used. And as you can see from this, this shows the uh, event-free survival and overall survival for patients who had a pet that was negative versus positive PET uh, at the completion of their salvage therapy prior to transplant with results that look very similar to Dr. Moskowitz's study. So on the left is the event-free survival. Again, about a three-year event-free survival of 80% if they had a negative PET after second-line salvage uh, heading into transplant. And in this study, the pre-transplant prognostic scores, uh, there were several scores that were looked at, did not correlate with outcomes, only the result of the PET. So then the next question is, should we add brintuximab to second-line regimens as pre-transplant salvage? And there are really two studies that have looked at this, and I know Anna's going to talk about this in more detail. Um, I put the outline of the two studies, but I'm really only going to talk about the results of the Memorial study. So both of these studies, one from Memorial and one from City of Hope, looked at using brentuximab vedotin as a single agent, and in patients who did not achieve a CR, they went on to receive salvage. In the memorial study, all of the patients received augmented ice. 
in the City of Hope study, it was physician decision, and there was a variety of, of regimens that were used. And in the memorial study, if they did not have a CR after BV, then they were required to get the augmented ice uh, before they went on to transplant. In the City of Hope study, the physician could make a decision, even if the patient wasn't in CR after BV, to proceed with the transplant. So the results of the memorial study, which again used two cycles of BV, uh, followed by augmented ice, that 27% of the patients achieved a negative PET following the BV, and 75% of the patients uh, still had a positive PET and went on to two cycles of augmented ice. 69% of those patients achieved a CR uh, by PET uh, and went on to transplant at that point. So overall, 73% of the patients were PET negative uh, before they went on to their transplant. And the very early event-free survivals were in the manuscript showing about an EFF, EFS of about 90%. So then the question is, is BV followed by augmented ice better than just giving ice or augmented ice followed by GVD uh, before the transplant? So um, the overall PET negative rate was 73% with the BV approach, 78% with our old approach. For augmented ice uh, times two, that interestingly in the BV approach that 75% of patients required augmented ice, whereas in the initial approach, only 42% of patients re required augmented ice. And if you look at the toxicities in the papers for the augmented ice versus ice, that the incidence of febrile neutropenia with ice was about 6%. With augmented ice, it's about somewhere between 20 and 30%. And so significantly more toxic, more hospitalizations with augmented ice, and a higher percentage of patients are actually receiving that uh, on, the B, on the sequential BV augmented ice arm. In terms of the transplant, that uh, delaying it an additional two months to receive, it, receive additional salvage therapy, that 75% of the patients with the new approach were delayed as opposed to 39% of patients with the old approach. The two-year event-free survivals uh, look similar, again, very early follow-up. So um, then the question is, what other obstacles uh, are going to be coming our way very shortly, uh, despite the ones that we've already outlined? And I've just put down sort of a laundry list of things that I worry about in terms of how to evaluate these new therapies and new combinations in this setting as we move forward. And the PFS endpoint in the current and the future trials will almost certainly reflect the use of BV maintenance in a certain percentage of patients, which is going to make that endpoint more difficult to look at. Um, the definition of the pre-transplant PET CR is a moving target. Uh, the initial publications use scores of one to two. The recent publications uh, suggest that score one to three is a CR. There's also been recent publications looking at Delta SUV in this setting and showing that perhaps that is equivalent to the Deauville score or even perhaps better. And then the other um, sort of kink will be the new response criteria that were recently published uh, for evaluating regimens that incorporate immunotherapy, such as PD-1 inhibitors. There's a new category called indeterminate response, uh, so not quite sure what we're going to do with that. And patients are treated through progressive disease for, a tw for 12 additional weeks, so the progression-free survival will be longer. And it's difficult to use the PET-CR as a primary endpoint in these studies because residual uptake may be coded as indeterminate response, um, and it's unclear if it represents disease. So again, these are kind of uh, in the future making it even more difficult to make this decision. So in conclusion, I think that the pre-transplant PET is highly predictive of outcomes in relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, and it does look like the CR matters. Um, the traditional second-line chemotherapy regimens, which I've listed there, um, have PET CR rates of higher than 50 percent, maybe as high as 60 percent, um, as opposed to single-agent BV, which has a PET CR rate of 30 percent and delays transplant in about 70 percent of patients. I think Anne will show us some uh, preliminary data, but we're certainly awaiting mature data on any BV chemo combinations. Um, and I think we definitely need a randomized trial comparing the chemo-only approach, one of these three regimens that I've listed, versus a BV-based regimen. My current approach is to give ice for two to three cycles. If they have a CR, we go on to transplant. If no CR, either BV or GVD uh, as third-line therapy. So currently, I don't think there is a role outside the setting of a clinical trial for incorporating BV as second-line treatment.
Thanks.